happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to our study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we are reading um, E.J. Wagner's response to G.I. Butler in his uh, review of the book in, in Galatians, or the Law in Galatians. So, um, <clears throat> and you can find this, it's it's sometimes find it online as a PDF called Two Books on Galatians. It'll have both Butler's and Wagner's um, papers. But anyway, before we begin here, um, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the blessings of this past week. And uh, we ask, Lord, for your presence to be here as we open your word together through the writings of E.J. Wagner. And um, we know, Lord, that we need your spirit, the same spirit that inspired the scriptures uh, to speak to our hearts and to give us wisdom and understanding. We know, Lord, that we have much to learn. And so we ask that you can be our teacher. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them. And may we receive the blessing of the Sabbath in its fullness, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, so what we are looking at is we were reading over this argument um, where Butler was trying to argue that in Galatians chapter 3, the law is the ceremonial law, and, and that this was added, um, the ceremonial law is added because of sin where we know that uh, the word added here, Wagner goes through a little bit of a um, a word study and shows that it's actually spoken. So you could use it spoken or promulgated, right? It doesn't make any difference. Um, and Hebrews 12, verse 18 to 19, in, in those verses um, that he's referring to, it says, um, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Right. So showing that this is when the law was spoken. Right. Um, so he's trying to show that the, the law here is the law of God. Right. It's. It's not referring to the animal sacrifices. Now, it is an expansion. You see it in Deuteronomy 27, where really what's what's being said is is an expansion of the Ten Commandments. It's just giving them more specific details, especially in regarding uh, how we treat one another. So, so this is definitely the moral law, not the ceremonial law that's being talked about. Um, so um just going to so he says here um deuteronomy five twenty two plainly says that the Ten Commandments were spoken by the Lord, and that nothing but the Ten Commandments was spoken or given or added galatians three nineteen tells us why they were spoken it was because of transgressions, that is because people were largely ignorant of the law. We may not play upon the word added. And you use it in a mathematical sense, like as if the ceremonial law is added to the law, uh, but must necessarily use it in the sense of declaring or speaking. There's no more moral law after God spoke it from Sinai than there was before. But it was certainly known a great deal better than it was before. And there was less excuse for sin than there was before. In the preceding verses, the apostle has spoken of the promise of Abraham and the covenant made to him. The statement that the covenant was confirmed in Christ shows plainly that the covenant to Abraham confirmed the forgiveness of sins through Christ. But the forgiveness of sin necessarily implies a knowledge of sin. Only the righteous, righteous can be heirs of the promise. And the knowledge of sin and righteousness can only be obtained through the moral law. Therefore, the giving of the law in a more specific manner than ever before was necessary 
in order that people might be partakers of the blessings promised to Abraham. The very same thing is stated in Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. And I never knew any Seventh-day Adventist to have any trouble in applying that to the moral law. Yet it is certainly as difficult as a text as Galatians 3.19. The word rendered entered is literally came in. Uh, the revised version has it came in beside. Uh, but the moral law existed before the days of Moses, as is evident from verse 13 and 14 of the same chapter, and also from the expression in the same verse that the offense might abound, showing that sin, the transgression of the law, existed before the law came in, although the law existed in all its force before the exode, yet it came in, entered, was spoken or given or added at that time. And why? That the offense might abound, that is, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And that was that that what was sin, that what was sin before might be the more plainly be seen to be sin. I would have probably said that which was sin before. But anyway, thus it entered or was added because of transgressions. If it had not been for the transgressions, there would have been no necessity for the law to enter at Sinai. Why did it enter because of transgression? That the offense might abound in order to make sin seem greater than ever before, so that men might be driven to the superabounding grace of God as manifested in Christ. And so it became a schoolmaster, pedagogue, to bring men to Christ in order that they might be justified by faith and be made the righteousness of God in him. And so it is stated later that the law is not against the promises of God. It works in harmony with the promise. For without it, the promise would be of no effect. And this most emphatically attests the perpetuity of the law. And I do not care for the opinions of commentators, except as they state in a clear form that which has already been proved from the Bible. But as you in your pamphlet seem to have placed considerable reliance upon the opinion of commentators, it may not be profitless to quote a few here. I, I do it, however, not because I think they add anything to the argument, but simply as an offset to your quotations and because they possibly state the case a little more clearly than I've done. Prope Professor Boise in his critical notes on the Greek text of Galatians says on this text, because of the transgression, because of the transgression, transgressions, that's the statement, because of the transgressions indicates, therefore, this idea to give a knowledge of transgressions, to make plainly clear and distinct what were actual transgressions of the divine requirements. He also says, in keeping with this idea, and perhaps implied, is the interpretation to restrain transgressions. He cites Erasmus, Olhassen, Neander, DeWitt, Ewald, Luther, Bengel, and others, um, as holding the same view. In the opinions of commentators, if the opinions of commentators are to decide the matter, I think that the moral law will come out ahead. Dr. Barnes says of the expressions, because of transgressions, on account of transgressions, or with reference to them, the meaning is that the law was given to show the true nature of transgression, or to show what was sin. It was not to reveal a way of justification, but it was to disclose the true nature of sin, to deter men from committing it to declare its penalty, to convince men of it, and thus to be ancillary to and preparatory to of the work of redemption through the Redeemer. This is the true account of the law of God as given to apostate man, and this use of the law still exists. A Dr. Clark says, it was given that we might know our sinfulness and the need we stood in the mercy of God. The law is the right line, the straight edge that determines the obliquity of our conduct. See the notes in Romans 4 or 5. Anyway, he says that's in his commentary, where this subject is largely discussed in the figure explained. So Wagner goes on. He says, your argument against the moral law uh, be added because of transgressions 
will apply with equal force against the moral law having entered that the offense might abound. If you claim that Galatians 3.19 cannot apply to the moral law, then you must claim also that Romans 5.20 does not apply to, the, to that law. I quote further from your pamphlet from the paragraph ending at the top of page 44. It would be absurd to suppose that this law was added to itself. It does apply, so this is what Butler said, right? It does not apply reasonably to another law brought in because the one previously existed had been violated. A law cannot be transgressed unless it exists. For no, where no law is, there is no transgression. So you can see he's just putting there his argument. His ar argument is it, it, it can't be the moral law because it was added. Um, and that nothing is added to the moral law. But of course, he said, I've already shown the force of the term added. I have never claimed that any law was added to itself or that any mathematical process is referred to by the word rendered added. What do you mean by saying a law cannot be transgressed until it exists? You seem to imply that the moral law did not exist so that it could not be transgressed before it was given up on Mount Sinai. I know you do not believe this, and yet in another paragraph, it is implied still more plainly. I will again quote Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This law unmistakably is the moral law. Yet you might say it is impossible that it should be the moral law because offenses existed before the law here spoken of entered, and where no law is, there is no transgression, and that therefore the law which has entered with some other law, but you would not argue that here. You would claim, as I do, that the meaning of the text is that the law entered or was given in order that sin might appear in its true enormity. As Paul elsewhere says, sin, by the commandment, became exceeding sinful. The moral law existed from creation and long before. The patriarchs had a knowledge of it, and also all the antediluvians and the sodomites, because they were not counted sinners because they were counted sinners, pardon me, yet it did not exist in written form. And those who were not in immediate connection with God could not have that perfect knowledge of the law, which would show them the full heinousness of sin or heinousness. They could know that the things which they committed were wrong, but they could not realize their full enormity. And especially was this the case when the Israelites came from Egyptian bondage. But God had made a covenant with Abraham and had promised wonderful things, but only on condition of perfect righteousness through Christ. And if men ever attain to this perfect righteousness, they must have the law in its fullest extent and must know that many things were sinful, which they might previously have thought were harmless. So the law entered that the offense might abound. And because the offense abounded and men saw their depravity, they found that grace superabounded to cover their sins. The case is so plain, and the argument from Galatians 3.19 is so plainly parallel that I marvel how anybody who has any just conception of the relation of the law and the gospel can question it for a moment. Again, on page 44, I read, the moral law is referred to, so this he's reading Butler, as the one transgressed. But the added law of which Paul was speaking made provision for the forgiveness of these transgressions in figure till the real sacrifice should be offered. Now, again, he's going to say, you, your misapplication of the word added, I've already sufficiently noted. But there is an idea expressed in the quotation just made, which I'm sorry to see has of late been taught to some extent. And that is that in the so-called Jewish dispensation, forgiveness of sins was only figurative. Your words plainly indicate that there was no real forgiveness of sins until Christ, the real sacrifice was offered. If that were so, I would like to inquire how Enoch and Elijah got to heaven. Were they taken there with their sins unforgiven? Had they been in heaven for two or three thousand years before their sins were forgiven? The very fact that they were taken to heaven is sufficient evidence that their sins were really pardoned. When David said, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, he means just what Paul did when he used the same words. David said to the Lord, thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, that no, that no 
that was no sham forgiveness. And it was expressly declared that if a soul should sin against any of the commandments of the Lord, he should offer his sacrifice and his sins should be uh, forgiven him. So he gives Leviticus 4, 2, 3, 20, 26, 31. Anyway, there was no virtue in the sacrifice, which was typical, yet the pardon was as real as any that had ever been given since the crucifixion. How could this be? Simply because Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, that he should offer himself as a sacrifice was promised to our first parents in Eden and confirmed by Abraham by an oath from God. And therefore, by virtue of that promise, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all who wished could receive as much virtue from the blood of Christ as we can. That forgiveness was real is shown by the fact that Abel, by his offering, received witness that he was righteous. Um. I lost my place here. But there can be no righteousness that has not been preceded by forgiveness. If the pardon were figurative, then the righteousness must also have been figurative. But Abel and Noah and Abraham and others were really righteous. They had the perfect righteousness of faith. Therefore, they must have had actual forgiveness. This is further shown from the fact that forgiveness of sins must precede all righteousness. There can be no righteousness without faith. And faith always brings pardon. So Romans 6, 23, Romans 3, 24, 25, and 5, verse 1. I quote the next paragraph of your pamphlet on page 44. Uh, Till the seed should come uh, limits the duration of the remedial system beyond all question. The word till or until ever has the, that signification. The added law then was to exist no longer until the seed should come. This the language unmistakably declares. Did the moral law extend to f- no further than the full development of the Messiah? No Seventh-day Adventist will admit that, but this was precisely the case with the law. So you can see uh, where Butler's coming from, so in his, his thinking. And, and I don't know, you know... This whole issue of, of of what they're discussing. I mean, it's it's obviously very important. The question is, how did Adventist ministers come to this conclusion? That's that's kind of the thing that puzzles me the most. But anyway, let's see what Butler's res- or Wagner's response is to Butler. You say that the added law was to exist no longer than t- till the seed should come, because the word till or until has ever the signification of a certain limited duration. Let me quote you a few texts. Psalm 112, verse 8. I read of the good man. I read of the good man. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. Do you think that that implies that as soon as the good man has seen his desire upon his enemies, he shall be afraid? Again, I read of Christ. In Isaiah 24, 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. Do you think the word till in this instant limits the duration of the time that Christ should not be discouraged? And does it imply that as soon as he has set judgment in the earth, he shall fail and be discouraged? The question answers itself. Does that mean that he did not live any longer? Not by any means. For in the 10th chapter, we read of a vision which was given him in the third year of Cyrus. Um, right. So so obviously Daniel was still there, um, though I think he's wrong about the third year of Cyrus. But anyway. Um, right. Because we know that uh, uh, the first year of Cyrus can have two different meanings. The third year of Cyrus is the first year of Cyrus. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. In first Samuel 1533 three says that Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Do you think that he went to see him as soon as he died? These texts show that till does not necessarily limit necessarily limit the duration of the thing to which it is applied and does not necessarily imply that the law ceases, ceases at the coming of the seed. The exact meaning of the term in this instance I reserve till later. Right. So he's just saying that 
it, it can't be the moral law because it's not going to continue. That's what Butler's saying. And based on the word till or until, which of course, as Wagner is showing, it doesn't necessarily mean what Butler is saying it means. Okay, I quote again from your pamphlet. The added law was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. All agree that this mediator was Moses, who went between God and the people. The original word for ordained is rendered promulgated by Greenfield, who cites this text as an illustration. Was it true that the Ten Commandments were ordained or promulgated by angels in or by the hand of Moses? God himself spoke them with a voice that shook the earth and wrote them with his own finger on the stone tablets. But the other law was given through angels and written in a book by the hand of Moses. If the reader desires to see some of the instances where the same expression substantially is used when speaking of the law of Moses, we refer him to Leviticus 26, 46, Numbers 4, 37, 15, 22, and 23, and especially Nehemiah 9, verse 13 and 14, where the distinction is clearly made between the laws which God spoke and the precepts, statutes, and laws given by the hand of Moses. So his argument here is that uh, by the hand of a mediator, and that mediator is Moses, so it can't be the Ten Commandments. Okay? So Wagner goes on to answer this. There are several points in this paragraph, (coughs) and we will note them in order. First, was the ceremonial law given by angels? Are those who hold, as you do, say that this was and quote Galatians 3.19 as proof. But that is not competent testimony on this point, for it is the text under discussion. But unfortunately for your theory, it is the only text that you can quote. And so the proof that the ceremonial law was given by angels is nothing but reasoning in a circle. Thus you say that Galatians 3.19 refers to the ceremonial law because it speaks of a law that was ordained by angels. And then you prove that the ceremonial law was spoken by angels by quoting Galatians 3.19, which you've already proved refers to the ceremonial law. This is not proving anything, but is simply begging the question. You started out to show that Galatians 3.19 is referenced to the ceremonial law because it speaks of a law ordained by angels. In order to make that good, you ought to cite at least one other text in the Bible where it is at least implied that the angels gave the ceremonial law, but this you cannot do. Now, on the other hand, the connection of angels with the giving of the Ten Commandments from Sinai is most clearly marked. I first cite Psalms 68, verse 1, verse verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Again, I refer to Deuteronomy 33, 2. The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Mount Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran. And he came with ten thousands of saints, holy ones, angels. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. These texts show plainly that the angels of God were on Sinai when the law was spoken. They were there evidently for a purpose, though we cannot tell what. But we have a still more emphatic testimony in Stephen's address. Acts 7, verse 51 to 53. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, ye... You always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. The law which these wicked Jews had not kept was the moral law, which Stephen said was given by the dispensation of angels or disposition of angels. The very same term that in Galatians 3.19 is rendered ordained by angels. The word diatasso rendered ordained means, according to Little and Scott, to range, ordain, establish, or set in order, draw up an army. The word disposition in Acts 7.53 is from diataxis, a noun derived from the preceding verb and means Disposition, arrangement, especially a drawing up of troops, order to battle. These words have also the signification of to decree, to will, but the former signification seems to convey the idea of the words as used in the texts quoted. The text under consideration does not say that the angels spoke the law 
and we know very well that they did not speak either the moral or the ceremonial law. The Lord himself spoke them both, the one directly to the people and the other to Moses. But the angels were there, evidently in their regular order, as the armies of heaven. Just what part they had to act, no one can tell, for the Bible does not specify. All I claim is that the scriptures speak of them as being intimately connected with the giving of the moral law. While there's not a text in the Bible which mentions them in connection with the giving of the ceremonial law, and the text in Acts, already quoted, plainly says of the moral law that it was given by the disposition of angels. The expression ordained by angels is the one upon which those who argue for the ceremonial law in Galatians have placed their principal reliance. But even that is against them. Second, the distinction which is made between the moral and ceremonial law, namely that the moral law was spoken by the Lord and the ceremonial law by Moses will not hold. The very texts you, which you cite are against this distinction. I'll take the first one, Leviticus 26, 46. It reads, these are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. This is the last verse of the chapter. The first two verses of the chapter read thus. Ye shall make no idols or, nor grave an image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up an image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. And then the chapter goes on with instructions to keep the commandments of the Lord, to walk in his statutes, tells what judgments shall come upon, well, there's some typos there, upon them if they break the commandments, especially the Sabbath, and closes with the words first quoted. But in all the chapter, there's not a shadow of reference to the ceremonial law. Your next reference, Numbers 437, is no references to either the moral or the ceremonial law. It simply states that Moses and Aaron numbered the family of the Kohathites according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Your third reference, Numbers 15, 22, and 23, has unmistakable reference to the moral law and to that alone, as will be seen by the 24, 25th, and 26th verses as read in connection. I will quote them. And if ye have erred and not observed all these commandments, which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, even all that the Lord hath commanded you by the hand of Moses, from the day that the Lord commanded Moses and henceforth among your generations, then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance, and they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord, um, for their ignorance, and it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel. All this atoning sacrifice was to be made on account of the sins against what the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. But nothing is sin except violation of the Ten Commandments. Your last reference, Nehemiah 9, verse 13 to 14, may have reference to both the moral and ceremonial law. I will quote the verses. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath and commandest them precepts, statutes and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. This is the only text of, of all to which you have referred, which even by implication refers to the ceremonial law. And it is certainly a strange Implication that limits by the hand of Moses to the law part of verse 14. All the other texts, at any rate, when they refer to any law at all, refer solely to the moral law, which is said to have been commanded by the hand of Moses. Um, yeah, Angela has a note here, I believe, ordained by angels, taught, promulgated by God's chief messengers, patriarchs and prophets, that is, his main human messengers. Certainly, Ellen G. White is affirming teacher of his law. So obviously it's the Ten Commandments <clears throat> that are being referred to, God's moral law. Now, um, there was a point that I was going to make. What was it? Uh, oh, just, you know, the, the question was, or the, the issue was that 
you know, Wagner and Jones were saying that the law in Galatians is only the moral law. And, and they, they admit many, many times that, that there is moral law within what we sometimes call the ceremonial law. Sometimes there are things that are moral, um, but um, what, what Butler is trying to argue and what, what many people, uh, the position that they take, because in, the, in, in the, the book of the law, it, does, it, it has the Ten Commandments, right? So, because um, the law of Moses is basically the first five books of the Bible, right? So those can also refer to the book of the law, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments are in there. So um, they're never saying that there is no mention or implication of the ceremonial law. Um, just that that primarily the issue is about the moral law. When we're not under the law, we're not under um, the moral law. We're not under its condemnation. Where, as you're going to see, when Butler talks about being under the law, he just means under obligation to keep it. And this becomes a, a really important point. Um, you'll perhaps say that I've broken down the distinction between the moral and the ceremonial law and have opened the way for the enemies of the law to confuse the two. So this is kind of the point here. Uh, but I have not. I have simply quoted the text to which you refer and have shown their exact application. There is no chance for confusion concerning the two laws, for we have this plain distinction. The moral law was spoken by the Lord with an audible voice in the fire and smoke of Sinai. The Ten Commandments are all that were given in this manner, and they alone were written on tablets or tables of stone by the finger of God. The ceremonial law was given in a more private manner. This certainly forbids any confusion. Both the moral and ceremonial law, however, are, as we have seen in the text quoted, said to have been given by the hand of Moses, and both were written in the book of the law. But there is still this distinction, that the ceremonial law was written only in the book, while the moral law was written on the tables of stone with the finger of God, and also in a book. Uh, that the term, the law of Moses, does sometimes refer to the Ten Commandments, will be evident for, to anyone who will carefully read Deuteronomy 4.44 to 5.22, onward and Joshua 23 6 and 7 first Kings 2 etc uh, see also the great controversy volume 2 page 217 and 218 beginning with the last paragraph on page 17 on the other hand the term the law of the Lord is applied to the ceremonial uh, ordinances um, um, for instance in Luke 2, 23, and 24, thus the term law of Moses and the law of the Lord are used interchangeably of both laws. Right? So both can be referred to either. Third, you say of the latter part of Galatians 3, 19, that all agree that this mediator was Moses. I do not agree. And I do not think that the text and the context warrant such an assumption. The apostle continues in the next verse. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now turn to 1 Timothy 25 and read, For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God is one party in the transgression, and Christ is the mediator. I suppose you will not question the statement that Christ was the one who spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. In Great Controversy, Volume 2, page uh, 217, concerning the Sermon on the Mount, I read, the same voice that declared the moral and ceremonial law was the foundation of the whole Jewish system. Um, uh, the same voice which was the foundation of the whole, that declared the moral and ceremonial law was the foundation of the whole Jewish system, uttered the words of instruction on the Mount. And this is indicated in the text under consideration. And also in Acts 738, where Stephen says of Moses, uh, this was he that was in the church in the wilderness with an angel which spoke to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers. That angel, we all understand to be the one that spoke to Moses out of the bush, the one that went before the children of Israel, to whom was the name of God, 
be none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. If I thought it necessary, I could give you plenty of scripture testimony on this point. And so the text under consideration, as I have proved in noting your points, teaches that the law was given upon Mount Sinai because of transgression, that is, the people might know what sin was and might appreciate the pardon that was offered in the covenant to Abraham and that it was thus given till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And the apostle shows the dignity and the value of the law by the statement that it was disposed or arranged or ordained by angels in the hand of our great mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not give a little attention to the expression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and show how it harmonizes with the other expressions in the verse as I have explained them. First, um, so he says, I will not give a little attention. It means he's going to give a lot, right? First, I will quote a reference, which you make to that. You say, another argument, a very late invention, designed to avoid the conclusion that the added law terminated at the cross, we briefly notice, it is the claim that the seed has not yet come and will not come till the second advent of Christ. It would be hard for the writer to really think that any believer in Christ would take that position had we not read it in our own beloved Signs of the Times of July 29th, 1886. <laughs> so, so this was Butler, what he says. Um, if this had been written by some men, so this is Wagner responding, I should think it was deliberate misrepresentation. For it certainly does woefully misrepresent the view which I take and have published. I've carefully reread my articles to see if, by any unfortunate expression, I had conveyed the idea that Christ, the promised seed, had, has not yet come. And I find no hint of such an idea. I have not, however, the slightest thought that you would willfully misrepresent any person, and I can only attribute your failure to state my position properly to a too hasty perusal of it. It is not at all surprising to me that in the little time which you had to spare, burdened at the same time with a multitude of cares to distract your mind, you did not grasp the whole of the argument, especially as it is one to which your mind had not been previously directed. But although your misrepresentation was unintentional, it does nonetheless convey an erroneous impression of my teaching. The argument which I put forth is not so late an invention as you think. I've held the view for several years and it was not original with me. But even if it were entirely new, that in itself uh, would be nothing against it. For every scribe which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and old, Matthew 13, 52. It is true that I held and still hold that the coming of the seed spoken of in Galatians 3.19 means the second coming of Christ, but that does not imply that Christ has not already come or that he is not now the seed. You often preach that the Lord is coming, and you no doubt uh, quote such texts of scripture as Psalms 53, 50 verse 3 4, and verse 4 and 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5 and scores of others. Now, if a man hearing you preach such a sermon should go off and say that you did not believe that the Lord came 1800 years ago, he would be no more out of the way than you are in saying that I have taught that Christ has not come. In the Old Testament, we have many references to the coming of Christ. Some of them mean his first advent and some his second. The only way we can distinguish between them is by events mentioned in connection with the references to the coming. And so we must decide here in Galatians 3.19. Uh, there's only one ground on which you claim that the coming of the seed cannot refer to the second coming of Christ. And that is by claiming that he will not be the seed then, that he is a seed only at the first advent. But such a claim cannot stand for a moment. For Christ is as surely the seed when he bruises the serpent's head as when he himself was bruised. He will be the seed when the promise is fulfilled to him. The matter then stands just this way. Christ is the seed. Therefore, to say, till the seed should come, is equivalent to say, saying, till Christ should come. And the next point is, 
does the expression the coming of Christ necessarily impri- apply to the first advent alone? Certainly it does not, for there are two advents, and the simple expression the coming of Christ may apply to either. Therefore, so far as the reason why it should not apply to the second advent as well as the first, indeed, we might say that there is an at- antecedent probability that it should refer to the second coming of Christ, for that is the more prominent coming of the two, and it is the one which we think always think of when the expression is unqualified. But in every case of this kind, the context must decide what coming is referred to. The application of Galatians 3.19 to the first advent of, of Christ arises largely, I think, from a careless reading of it. Uh, you argue as though it read, till the seed should come of whom the promise was made. Uh, but it is till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The apostle is not dealing with the idea that the seed was promised to Abraham, but he is speaking of the of the promise that was made to Abraham and to his seed, the seed being Christ. Now, if you can find a single promise that was fulfilled to Christ at his first advent, there will be some show of reasoning reason to applying Galatians 3.19 to the first advent of Christ, but you cannot. There was absolutely nothing that Christ then received. No part of the promise was fulfilled to him. He received only rebuffs, reproaches, mockings, poverty, weariness, scourging, and death. Moreover, the promise to Abraham and his seed is a joint promise, but certainly no promise was fulfilled to Abraham at the first advent of Christ, for Abraham had then been dead 2,000 years. Uh, The apostle connects the coming of the seed with the fulfillment of the promise to him is evident from the simple reading of the text. A certain promise had been made to Abraham and his seed, and a certain thing was given for a special purpose. um, Until the seed to to whom the promise was made should come, The idea that inevitably follows from the reading of the text, letting each clause have its proper weight, is that at the coming referred to, the seed will inherit the promise. I shall give something more on this point a little further on. But there is no need of any conjecture as to what the promise is, which is referred to in this verse. The 18th verse reads thus, For if the inheritance be of the law, It is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And then the 19th verse continues. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. This shows most conclusively that the promise referred to is the inheritance. This promised inheritance is the whole world. And there's no need of presenting argument to show that the inheritance is still future. Christ has not received it, for we are joint heirs with him and through faith will likewise receive it. Just a note here from Angela. Okay, just thanks for that comment there. Which, okay. <clears throat> Let me read this here again. That the apostle connects the coming of the seed with the fulfillment of the promise to him is evident from the simple reading of the text. A certain promise had been made to Abraham and his seed, and a certain thing was given for a special purpose until the seed to whom the promise was made should come. The idea that inevitably follows from the reading of the text, letting each clause have its proper weight, is that at the coming referred to, the seed will inherit the promise. I shall give something more further on this point, right? So the idea here, as we see, that this promise um, is the promise of Christ, of the inheritance, right? So uh, we went here. um, So this here is down this this verse, uh, down halfway through this paragraph. This promised inheritance is the whole world, and there's no need of presenting argument to show that the inheritance is still future. Christ has not received it, for we are joint heirs with him, and through faith will likewise receive it. And this makes of no value your argument that the promises to the seed, many of them, reach beyond the second advent, as does this one, even into eternity. So according to this reasoning, we may wait to all eternity for the seed to come. 
That argument, if it proved anything in this connection, would simply prove that the promise to Abraham and his seed will never be fulfilled, which is contrary to the word of God. But as we have seen, there are not many promises referred to in this 19th verse, but only the one promise, the inheritance. And that promised inheritance will be received at the second coming of Christ and not before. But you say that even this promise is not fulfilled to the end of the thousand years, and that therefore if the coming of, of the seed is not till the fulfillment of the promise, the seed cannot come till the end of the 1,000 years, for the land is not inherited by Abraham till that time. And this argument might indeed be called a late invention. I am I'm certain it is a new one among our people. It is true that the saints do not dwell on the earth till the close of the 1,000 years. But it is not true that they do not possess it or inherit it till that time. If they do not, then what does Christ mean in Matthew 25, verse 31 and 34, where he says that when he comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and shall separate the righteous from the wicked and shall say to the righteous, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, the mistake into which you fall is in supposing that the saints cannot possess the earth till they dwell upon it. If that were true, it would apply equally to Christ that he cannot possess it until he dwells upon it. But we read in Psalm 2, verse 8 and 9, these words of the Father to the Son, Ask of me, and I shall give thee <clears throat> the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. We learn from this, as well as from Revelation 11, verse 15 to 19, and other texts, that Christ receives the kingdom just before he comes to this earth. And it is not until after the uttermost parts of the earth are given to him for his possession that he dashes the nations in pieces like a potter's vessel. If Christ did not possess the earth, he would not have the right to do this. The wicked subjects of Satan now claim possession of the earth, which has been promised to Christ. When that promise is fulfilled and the earth is given into his possession, then he will rid it of those who have usurped dominion. He inherits the earth while the wicked are still upon it, but he cannot dwell upon it until they are removed. We say he cannot dwell upon it, not because he has not the power, but because he cannot take up his abode upon it while it is so impure. The fact, however, that he does that he does with the nations according to his will, rooting them out of the earth, shows that the earth is his possession. The same argument applies to the saints. They are joint heirs with Christ. This means that they receive their inheritance at the same time he does. When he comes to this earth, having received his kingdom, he calls them to inherit it with him. They do not at once dwell upon the earth, but they dwell in its capital, the new Jerusalem, and possession of the capital of any kingdom is usually considered as evidence of the possession of the kingdom itself. Moreover, the saints during the thousand years sit upon thrones, judging the wicked and determining the amount of punishment that shall be given to them. Thus, they are sharers with Christ in the work of ridding their common possession of its encumbrances. It is just as though you and I should be joint heirs of a farm. At a certain time, we are given possession, but we find that it is entirely overrun with thorns and briars. And so before we take up our abode upon it, we clear off this growth of rubbish and burn it up. The wicked are the tares that cumber the farm that is promised to Abraham and his seed. When Abraham and his seed shall be given possession, they will clear it of this foul growth and then will dwell upon it. This brief argument shows clearly what I thought was already established among us, namely that Christ and the saints possess the kingdom when he comes the second time. Having settled these points, namely that the promise means the inheritance of the earth, and that this promise to Abraham and his seed is fulfilled at Christ's second coming. We are prepared to go on. A prominent idea in this chapter is that is by what means the promise is obtained. The promise is the uppermost thought in this verse. 
the apostle is showing that the inheritance is gained solely by faith, that it is not of the law, but of faith in the promise. And then he carries us down to the time when the promise shall be fulfilled. But the coming that is referred to is the second coming of Christ, when the promise shall be fulfilled, is a most natural and easy conclusion. And it makes harmony of the text. I think you overlooked a parallel text, which I quoted in my articles. It is in Ezekiel 21, verse 26 and 27. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. And this shall not be the, the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is. And I will give it him. Here we have an unmistakable reference to the seed in the words, he whose right it is. And it is plainly declared that when he whose right it is comes, the inheritance will be given him. Uh, these words were written nearly 600 years before Christ's first advent. And yet it is not necessary for me to enter into an argument to convince you that the first advent is, of Christ is not referred to here. In Galatians 3.19, Paul is speaking of the inheritance and says, as to the seed shall come to whom the promise was made. In the text just quoted from Ezekiel, the prophet is speaking also of the inheritance and says, till he come whose right it is. Now, why is it any more absurd to say that the first expression refers to the second coming of Christ than to say that the sec second refers to that event? Now, now this verse, the overturning, because Babylon has it, right? And then it's going to be overturned to Medo Persia, overturned to Greece, and overturned to Rome. Now, so we often do place this um, that Christ comes in the time of Rome, but it's also true that Christ comes in the time of Rome the second time, right? That Rome is the last kingdom, right? We know, of course, it's divided in different ways, but there really is only four kingdoms. Right? We would, we would agree on that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, now if you say the coming of the seed has no reference to the second advent, because when this coming spoken of takes place, the ceremonial law is to terminate, you beg the question entirely. If you say, as you do in your pamphlet, that applying that coming to the second advent, the law which is spoken of to the moral law, uh, would make the moral law terminate at the second coming of Christ. I've already answered that, for I have shown that till does not necessarily mean termination. I believe most emphatically that the law referred to is the moral law and that the coming of the seed is the second advent of Christ. But I do not believe that the moral law is going to terminate when Christ comes. And Galatians 3.19 does not indicate that it will. In order to establish your point, that the coming of the seed cannot refer to the second advent of Christ. It would be necessary for you to show that Christ was the seed only at the first advent, and that he is not the seed since. But Genesis 3.15 says not only that the serpent should bruise the heel of the seed at the first advent, but that the seed should bruise the serpent's head at the second advent. When Christ comes the second time, he is still the seed. So when Paul says, till the seed comes, it need no more be confined to the first advent than when he says, till the Lord comes. Lest it should be objected that Christ does not bruise Satan's head at his second coming, but only after the close of the thousand years, I will remind you that the wicked are not punished until after the close of the thousand years, yet they are said to be punished at the coming of the Lord. And so they are, for the second advent, like the first, covers a period of time. The first advent of Christ covered all the time of his earthly ministry, the second advent covers all the time from the appearance of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven until the wicked are destroyed out of the earth. Uh, the argument thus far on the coming of the seed has been negative in order to meet some of your objections. I will not give some I will not give some positive argument that the coming referred to is to the second advent. In doing this, I shall also proceed to consider verses 22 and 20 to 25, for they have an intimate connection with verse 19. Uh, verses 24 and 25 read thus, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, 
that when we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. By no manner of reasoning, reasoning whatever, can these verses may be made to apply to the ceremonial law. The reference must be to the moral law and to that alone, as I, I shall, shall show. Now, <clears throat> I think we're going to leave that part uh, for next week. We're just going to go through this. But I, I want to look at these verses in Galatians. So let's go there. So in Galatians chapter 3, because, and, and you're going to see how he addresses this um, later. But um, the law, law was our schoolmaster. So often people, when they become Seventh-day Adventists in the evangelistic series in the past, we would say, Oh, that was the ceremonial law. So it is true. There was a, there was a position which Butler holds that the law here can't be uh, the moral law, right? Because um, because after faith has come, we are no longer under the moral law. That would be his argument. He would say, well, this has to be the ceremonial. It has to be the ceremonial, not the moral. Um, because he doesn't, he believes that we are still under the law. That means under obligation to keep it, even after we have faith. Right? So that is kind of the argument. Um, so the schoolmaster argument, uh, referring to the moral law, uh, we have to understand what the role of the schoolmaster is. So that's, and he's going to go into that in in the study. But he says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Right. So this is building into what he was talking about before. So so Christ is the promised seed. And in Christ, we are Abraham's seed and, and heirs according to that promise, because that promise is the covenant promise. And in understanding this, if you study this on your own, uh, then to understand what the law, the moral law, the role that it plays within the covenants. And if, if this law was the ceremonial law, uh, then none of this makes sense. Okay, so so we're going to see when we look at this next week. I want you to kind of study this on your own. Think about it. <clears throat> now, one thing I find interesting with Wagner and and with Jones too is the things that they notice, the details, the way that they study. Um, and I believe that the way that they've been they were studying was to understand God's word, that that Wagner is not primarily studying to show that somebody else is wrong. Jones is not studying to show that somebody else is wrong. He's not he's not studying because he's arguing. Now, he is presenting arguments, but he has studied these things before these arguments came. And you understand the difference? So, yeah. Because, because when you're studying in, in that, to just think about arguments, there are some people when they study the Bible, it's always to show that someone else is wrong. That is, they're arguing or they're studying in a dialectical environment. That is, they believe that there's a wrong view and that your role as a Bible student is to always show where someone else is wrong. What's the problem with that? Well, you cut them off. Okay, well, yes, but what's the problem with that in how we then understand the Bible? Are we going to learn from God's word when we're always arguing uh, our position? What's going to happen to our understanding? We have to feed off other people, too. Okay, but if we have a position and we start arguing and we're studying God's word to just support a position. We're, we're basically digging in. 
We're digging in our heels. Are we going to be able to receive new light? I would say no. No, right? And, and we see this all the time. We run into it all the time as Seventh-day Adventists, when we're on Facebook, when we're on different social media, when you watch different videos that people are using. Jones and Wagner are studying to see new things from God's word, new things that support old things, right? That is, they're trying to understand the light of the past, and they're studying the scriptures to understand, not to argue. And, and you, you've seen that in how we have dealt with the controversies that have existed within the movement in our studies on Daniel's last vision. Have we studied uh, by digging in our heels on our positions or have we uh, grown in our understanding because we're trying to understand? What have we, what have we done? Have we, we looked at everything openly looking for light no matter where it comes from? For those of you that have been in the morning studies. Yes, that's what we're doing. We're studying to show ourselves. We want to understand. We're not trying to destroy somebody else. We're not trying to, you know, like the YouTube, you know, destroyed, right? We're not, we're not trying to put someone down. We're not trying to show somebody up. And, and I find it always interesting that there are people who have, who have followed the studies and at times, um, have just been trying to find fault with what we are saying and often accusing us of, of being in error and, and closed minded and proud and things like that. Um, while they show no interest in just trying to understand something, that is they have a position and uh, they want me to share in that position. So they may share something, they put a comment on the video and, and sometimes they have things that are correct. I mean, I look at them. And sometimes they have things that we look at and we decide, no, this, this doesn't really make sense. But we look at it. And, and, and so this is what I see with, with Jones and Wagner's. They're trying to understand. They're studying in the correct way. And that's how we are to study. Not to, not to support a view that we already hold. Not to, you know, to dig in our heels. Not to um, have confirmation bias. Uh, ruling us. We have to approach God's word as a student. Sounds like they were, What's that? Sounds like they really use Miller's rules. Yeah, well, and, and the thing is, I mean, we often have been like that, so it's not like I'm saying that, you know, we are superior than everyone else in how we study. But we have learned that if we want to understand God's word, we can't be in a dialectical environment. We can't be, it's just us and them. It can't be black and white. That sometimes there are things in God's word that if we can allow God to teach us, it will correct us. We will actually come to understand the scriptures differently. And, and so that is an extremely important way to come to God's word. So we'll, we'll look at this again. Um, next week uh, let's close with prayer the dear father in heaven we are grateful for the sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have we pray for the studies tomorrow that we can receive a blessing and um, we pray for those around us that we can influence them for good we ask for your angels care and protection over those that we love and um we leave our lives in your hands, and we pray and thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.